Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about the new, or is it the same, Cold War. Our guest, Vijay Prashad, is the author of dozens of books and countless articles. His books, including The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. He is executive director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, where he has just published an article or newsletter called The winds of the new Cold War are howling in the Arctic Circle. Vijay Prashad, welcome to Talk World Radio. Well, it's an honor to be with you, David, because World Without War is not only a great name for an organization, but it's a great aspiration. We do want a world without war. Uh, Absolutely. I could not agree more. Um, the, The nation's bordering the arctic don't seem to be on board with that are they are they able to cooperate or collaborate on protecting the area or even on destroying the area or would they be if not for the war in ukraine well let's start with the slogan the slogan is collaborate not confront each other collaboration not confrontation that's the slogan that was put out there at the start of the pandemic by the head of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I remember listening to Dr. Tedros say this at a press conference, you know, collaboration, not confrontation. And I thought, wow, that's such an elementary idea that we're stuck in the middle of a pandemic. The world needs to collaborate. We don't need confrontation. What Tedros was reflecting on was the views coming out of Washington, D.C., where Donald Trump was essentially saying, China is to blame, you know, this is a Chinese thing, nothing to do with the United States. He made no preparations and essentially allowed the pandemic to run roughshod over the U.S. population. Tedros was saying, don't take that attitude. United States, China, big countries with major medical systems need to collaborate with each other. In the same way, the eight countries that border the Arctic need much more collaboration and much less confrontation. After all, the Arctic or the polar cap is an essential part of the debate around the climate catastrophe. As the planet has been warming, the polar ice cap has been melting. As the polar ice cap melts, sea levels rise, small nations around the world are going to disappear, those that have, um, you know, that are on the water line. So these governments that border the Arctic um, formed an Arctic Council in 1996 whose actual um, mandate was to ensure the environmental protection of the Arctic uh, polar ice cap. That was their mandate in 1996. Well, look at where it is now, David. Now the Arctic Council has fallen apart because seven of the members refused to work with the eighth member, which is Russia, Russia has one of the largest land, the Arctic littoral or the land mass that's alongside the Arctic to shun Russia, not to talk about the Arctic and common concerns seems juvenile to me, particularly given recent data coming out of Arctic um, melt of the opening up of a northern sea route. That means that no longer do you have to wait for the summer for ships to go from, let's say, of Vladivostok on the on the Pacific Ocean uh, through the Arctic um, to the Baltic Sea. You don't have to wait for the summer because even in the winter, uh, there's a, a channel opening up. This is of great concern to people who look at the climate catastrophe. So yes, the eight countries of the Arctic Rim are certainly not collaborating. Instead, they are party to this confrontation that we call the new Cold War. And and what are we to make, uh, Vijay Prashad, of governments that assist in creating this catastrophic melting and then exploit that to go after more fossil fuels that become accessible because of the melting in order to burn them to create yet more melting? They can't claim ignorance about what they're doing, but how... How are we to understand this? Reality is insane, David. Um, You know, reality is not sane. That's the first thing. 
people should stop trying to understand things by rational choice theory you won't get it you got to understand things perhaps following richard nixon's madman theory of international relations it's true the moment the ice started melting it became clear that it was getting cheaper and cheaper to exploit fossil fuels within the arctic circle that 66 degrees north um this is part of the debate in the united states around the um the alaskan drilling you know in the northern reserves north of alaska um the canadians are already uh, exploiting fossil fuels in the very north in the deep north the russians are looking at fossil fuel exploitation it's not just fossil fuels that's only part of it the other part is it's very clear that the arctic area and perhaps because it had been protected by deep ice um had underneath it many rare earth minerals and metals things that could be useful for our advanced electronics and there's a great interest in mining for these rare earth metals and minerals in fact greenland which just to remind your listeners david they may, might not know this greenland is a colony of denmark uh, greenland has a, a lot of exploitable minerals and metals and many multinational corporations several of them canadian and australian and from the us have been very interested in getting contracts in danish held greenland but luckily fortunately the population of greenland has fought them off all of this is to say that there are peoples who live in the northern regions who are not interested in seeing their world being destroyed by large scale mining not only of fossil fuels but also of rare earth minerals and metals the fact is that you're quite right as the ice recedes new opportunities come for greater resource exploitation which is going to further the recession of the ice which is going to increase sea levels and wipe out islands uh, from the planet earth and also not only islands but you know waterfront property what was that famous country music song i'm going to buy a house in southern arizona whatever it is it will have beachfront property because california is going to disappear yeah <laughs> it's not funny anymore is it's it it's not funny anymore uh the, the greenland is not just a colony of denmark right it also uh has us military presence including a base where the indigenous population that we ought to be looking to for wisdom on the, these matters was displaced in order to to build a base there and and the us has bases in a number of these countries and all of these countries have their own bases around the arctic now right well the united states base is interesting you know any time i visit the united states and drive on a freeway and i see that thing that people have on top of their cars to put extra stuff you know it's a company called thule t h u l e well that's the name of the air base in northern greenland and it's been there um since the cold war um it was a major point of confrontation at that time indigenous people were removed from that uh, region to build the base not only that base you're quite right to say that other countries also have bases canada for instance has been in fact kick starting bases that they had mothballed uh, earlier as this this new cold war enters the deep north um many countries including the russians are opening up old bases um and beginning to you know fashion them as frontal points uh, for confrontation against each other i must say recently in uh, in in reykjavik in iceland the nato admiral rob bauer who's an admiral uh, from the royal netherlands uh, navy who heads nato's um you know operations in the deep north uh, had a confrontation of his own where he talked uh with great feeling about how the russians and the chinese were being um sort of greedy up in the deep north and he was challenged by the chinese ambassador to iceland who said listen you you're paranoid i mean in fact admiral bauer was not just being paranoid he was being a little duplicitous because it's not just the russians and chinese up there it's everybody you might want to have your your listeners know david that 60% of the world's mining companies are domiciled in Canada uh, not in China not in Russia they are domiciled in Canada it's canadian mining companies that are leading 
this Arctic rush, very dangerous Arctic rush, I must say. Any any superior behavior from any of the the smaller countries? Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden. Uh, any any points of of wisdom or steps towards sustainable actions? You 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 make me want to start crying. In fact, um, by saying that, and the reason is, for many decades there used to be a a view, let's say of Scandinavian liberalism or Scandinavian social democracy being somehow superior uh, to the cowboy instincts of the United States or the Soviets or whatever. Well, there's no sign of it now. Um, in fact, with Finland and Sweden uh, at the doorstep of joining NATO, um, seven of the eight countries in the Arctic um, a council used to be the Arctic Council that rimmed the Arctic will be NATO members, you know, Canada, the United States, uh, and, and Norway, and so on. Seven of the eight. The eighth that is not a NATO member, in fact, used to be a NATO member of a sort, used, used to be a partner in peace of NATO, was part of the G8, and that's Russia. So, in fact, this confrontation between the West and Russia now uh, has put everybody in line. Not one of the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Norway, Sweden, which has a deep North presence, not one of them has taken a kind of non-aligned uh, position on this. Essentially, the Arctic countries are divided by the quote-unquote Western countries and Russia. And that's how it stands. It's the Wild West. They're standing there, each of them, with their hands just above their pistols, ready to shoot. And the tragedy is they're not going to actually kill each other. They're going to kill the planet, and they don't see it. Or the rest of us are not watching what they're doing. And I think that's why I was very keen on highlighting this new Cold War in the Arctic, because it's really been happening out of sight. When it comes, uh, Vijay Prashad, to the melting of the Arctic, uh, it's not just the nations that neighbor it, it's the entire world, including, of course, the United States at the top of the list uh, that are responsible for that, whether they, they border it or not, right? We ought, to, we ought to have global collaboration on protecting this. Well, you know, in the 1970s, there was a debate about who gets to regulate and manage the oceans. Um, it resulted in a treaty, uh, the UN Convention on the Seas. The United States actually signed the treaty but never ratified it. So the United States is not part of um, the Laws of the Sea Treaty. Well, the Laws of the Sea Treaty is interesting. It is supposed to manage the seabed uh, and, and any mining in the seabed. So an agency was created, the International Seabed Authority, which is based in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, now... They are a controversial group because there's a lot of mining companies that have had their nose stuck deep into the International Seabed Authority. The International Seabed Authority is developing a mining code for the seabed. In fact, therefore, it impacts the Arctic. What's really tragic is that the island state of Nauru, which is going to be submerged if sea levels rise, was the country that was kind of prodded by mining companies to go to Kingston, Jamaica, to the Seabed Authority and ask for um, a new mining code because Nauru wants to drill off the coastline of this rapidly shrinking island nation. So a country that is going to disappear was utilized by the mining companies and its elites actually went hand in glove with the mining companies to essentially allow for deep seabed mining. Now, it's interesting that in the Antarctic, we do have a treaty, a 1959 treaty that prohibits mining, which is to the good, you know, because the Antarctic is a vast continent. Um, and I don't want to see um, mining rigs set up on that ice sheet. You know, imagine what the, what the penguins are going to do if they're going to have to compete with spilled oil and so on. Um, that's not happening right now. Just the cruise ships that... Um, that released their garbage in the penguins' habitat. But in the um, north, this, these, these new mining rules are going to actually impact the north because as it is, countries exercise their sovereignty and say, look, if it's within 12 nautical miles or if it's even within 20 nautical miles of our 
uh, of our shelf, uh, then we're allowed to mine. We don't have to take permission. It's what happens after that. And if the seabed authority starts giving licenses for mining outside that, it's going to be a disaster. So what I would just say is it's kind of a tragedy that Nauru was the country that approached, um, you know, it's a Shakespearean tragedy because the country that would disappear as a consequence of mining is the one that has asked for mining. It's like, it's like sawing the branch on which you're sitting. Do we, do people anywhere have any popular influence over these decisions? I mean, this is an international body misrepresenting a bunch of misrepresentative governments. How do we influence what they permit mining co corporations to do? I mean, I would like to say that in this sense, the climate movement needs to get into the weeds of some of these issues. You know, um, I think there's just too much focus on the COP, the conference of parties that happens annually around the um, the climate treaty, the Paris treaty and so on. I, I think there's too much focus there. There's a lot of mischief that happens in the corners, David. You know, the dust settles in the corners. It doesn't sit in the middle of the room. You got to look where the dust is settling in the corners and things like the International Seabed Authority are the corners of these debates, you know, and I just think there's so little attention paid to some of these matters that we don't even know where to begin uh, to start influencing things. For instance, just to give you an example, there are movements in the country of Nauru that are deeply opposed to seabed mining off their shorelines, you know. Um, we need to lift up their voices. You know, they need to be fighting their government to prevent their government from coming and putting a piece of paper down in Kingston, Jamaica. At the same time, I think countries outside the Arctic need to be putting a... I mean, frankly, the United States is, is here, as usual, criminal number one. Um, I mean, you know, it, you know what when, when there's something like the International Seabed Authority... The U.S. and Canada and Australia, these are the countries with the largest mining companies. They are out. They are, have their lobbyists all over the place in Kingston, Jamaica. You know, almost a third of the Seabed Authority's council is made up of mining people, you know, people who come from the mining world. Well, who are they? They are ex-Canadian officials. They are people from the U.S., Australia, and so on. I mean, in the United States, there needs to be some precision, I think, in what is being targeted. Uh, give you an example. I was glad to see Code Pink target BlackRock. BlackRock is one of the great criminals in the planet. You know, you want to talk criminals, BlackRock is right up there. And it would be very good for the climate movement in the US to pick a target like BlackRock and to show other people how BlackRock is really destroying the world. You know, that kind of thing has an impact. You know, it, it really does have an impact on people's understanding of what is possible and what they can do, how they can get involved. You can't go up there and stand in front of the rig in the Arctic. You know, we can't afford to go up there. We don't have the capacity, but we can certainly put pressure on corporations in countries like Canada, the United States, um, in countries like Australia, the big mining companies. They need to be exposed, and they're not being exposed. And one of the reasons they don't get exposed, David, is many of them slyly are domiciled in the city of London, the great black hole of international corporate gangsterism. It's the city of London, which you know people may not know, is not London, the city. It's actually a part of London, which has got its own jurisdiction. And companies that register in the city of London essentially don't declare anything to anybody. And that's where many of the criminals are. There's got to be pressure in the UK against the kind of blanket protection and immunity that the UK government gives to these gangster companies in the city of London. You talk about how we can't afford to all fly up to the Arctic to, to take care of it. I'm reminded about a month ago, there was a column by a New York Times columnist where this guy openly bragged about how he refused to look at the evidence of, of climate collapse for years until someone flew him to look at a melting glacier. And now he believes it uh, and, and has all of his misguided recommendations for what to do about it but but proudly like this is exactly what everyone should do they should we should all refuse to believe anything until we're flown up there to you know but this is 
this is openly a recipe for disaster, right? Also, what are you looking at? Like, how do you know that there's melt? You know, look, it's not about what you can see. We're not going back to the debate with David Hume and empiricism and so on. It's about the lack of trust of scientists. We're, we're, we're in a funny world, you know. We're told we should trust bankers. We're tro told we should trust the people who run um, the ministries of finance and, and the ministry of treasury and so on. Technocracy is good when it comes to money. Technocracy is not good when it comes to nature. So we shouldn't believe scientists, but we should believe bankers. I mean, it's a funny valorization of a certain kind of technocrat. Why would I believe an economist, you know, who has um, multiple opinions about everything? You know, but yet you're supposed to say, well, Larry Summers, you know, Larry Summers recently made a video sitting somewhere in the Caribbean. I don't know where he was with a beach behind him talking about the necessity of unemployment in order to get the economy moving again. Here he was basically with a pina colada beside him. I mean, I was hoping that the song they would start playing with Larry Summers sitting there would be Carly Simon's You're So Vain. You know, because that song was written for a certain gentleman who liked to sing about pina coladas. So there's the pina colada. There's Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, Chief Economist at the World Bank and so on, saying that there needs to be mass suffering in order for the economy to recover. Why should I trust him? On the other hand, we are told, trust the bankers, trust Larry Summers. You know, these are the geniuses, Warren Buffett. But don't trust the scientists. It's not about flying up to see the melting glacier, that, that's absurd. It's about building popular trust in the science that's coming out of, you know, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. These are some of the world's top scientists. I don't think they're lying to us about the climate catastrophe. I, I just don't believe that that's what they're doing. You know, there's no mass scale hysteria created as the right wing wants us to believe around the climate. It's a real problem, guys. And there are real easy solutions to this problem that do not require nuclear power and so on. There are much easier solutions, one of which is to figure out, use our collaborative potential across countries, not to confront each other, but collaboratively come up with new scientific solutions to deal differently with energy. The Chinese right now are the world leader in solar technology. You know, you've got to have US, Europe, China, everybody collaborate on this. Otherwise, we're all going to die together. Frankly, that's why Dr. Tedros's slogan appealed to me so much. Collaboration, not confrontation. In other words, survival, not annihilation. Vijay Prashad, while we're supposed to be suspicious of the scientists and trust the economists and the bankers, we're supposed to bow down and treat as gospel what comes out of the heads of militaries. Uh, and in writing about this new Cold War, you recently pointed out that uh, a man with decades long record of lying who long since ought to have been held accountable for his misdeeds, one of the few voices in the media talking any sense about the new Cold War. I'm, I'm speaking of Nobel Peace Prize laureate uh, Henry Kissinger. Yes. Now, um, it is always surprising to me to learn that Mr. Kissinger is still alive because Mr. Kissinger has been with us for decades and decades and decades. And I must say that for whatever reason, over the last 20 odd years, Mr. Kissinger has been counseling um, a closer relationship between the United States and China. Now, you've got to understand also that Kissinger was one of the architects of the um, Nixon Mao meeting in 1972. So he's had this in his head for a long time. And if anybody has been able to go through his enormous book called On China, you see that he has a certain um, regard for what the Chinese have been doing over this period. You know, he, he's, he's not a communist. He's not a Maoist, but he has a regard for the Chinese being able to exercise their sovereignty. What's the problem that the United States has with China? The problem is that China has developed technologies on its own and that they are giving U.S. companies a serious run for their money. And the United States has not come to understand that. The U.S. believes that there's a military solution to the fact that China has developed certain technological areas advance of the U.S. In fact, Biden 
at the Indonesia meeting of the G20 um, started to recognize this when he made a public statement saying that the United States and China need to manage their competition. In fact, Biden should have said that to himself in the mirror because it's not like China is trying to accelerate some kind of war with the United States. They don't, they don't really want any kind of conflict. They are trying to trade the U.S. Um, out of the world domination. I mean, that's what they're doing. They have enormous capacity to invest, to build the Belt and Road Initiative and so on. The United States has to compete with China um, economically. Why are you trying to divert an economic competition into a military one? And I think Kissinger is warning against that. He's saying, look, if you don't invest infrastructure in the U.S., you're never going to be able to compete with China. You know, you've got to get the billionaires to be taxed in the U.S., use that money to upscale U.S. infrastructure. I mean, every time I fly into a U.S. airport or try to take U.S. trains, it's scandalous. It looks like the United States is in another century. When you travel in China, the trains are extraordinarily good. You know, there's no breakdowns. Um, they've been able to create high-speed rail that goes, you know, much faster than anything in the United States. So what Kissinger is saying, in fact, what Biden was also saying, is you've got to improve your infrastructure in the country. That's why he had that big investment bill. Somehow there is a nutcase political party in the U.S. that blocks even semi-rational ideas. And there's a billionaire class that has been on tax strike for about 40 years, if not longer. Problem isn't China. The problem is the billionaire class. People need to focus on that. And I'm really happy to see Henry Kissinger um, in his dotage speak a lot of sense. <laughs> you get something good out of anybody, I guess, if you wait long enough. Uh, Vijay Prashad, we got just about one minute left. Can you tell us uh, what we should be doing and, and where we can keep up with your work and get in touch with you? Well, I'm glad that you said that. I, I direct an institute called Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. We produce a lot of material that essentially comes as far as we can do from the ground up. And I'm very keen that people look at some of our new materials. We have a terrific study on Pentecostalism in Brazil and the impact that has had on the growth of the far right in Brazil. We saw that on January 8th in Brasilia. Uh, we have a text coming out this month on the 50th anniversary of the 1973 strikes in Durban, South Africa, that really kick off a new phase of the mass anti-apartheid movement. We have a ton of interesting material, some historical, some contemporary. I really welcome people to come to our website. Wonderful. We've been speaking with Vijay Prashad, author of numerous books and articles uh, and the... Uh, Executive Director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Vijay, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks a lot, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at Talk World Radio. Org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.